Hi guys, welcome to Wednesday's weekly broadcast here at Unbox Your Gift. I'm Rita Joyant, where we talk about advice, interviews, conversation with entrepreneurs, academics, employees, thought leaders, business owners, and really talk about how they unraveled what their passion was. So those who have walked your path and who can give you some insight and maybe some shortcuts into what you can do to better kind of guide your way through your own path. So if you're in a position where you don't like the job that you're doing or you're unhappy with it, you're boring on hating it, just clocking in and clocking out, or you feel like you've got more potential to give, you just don't know what that potential is or what more it might be, but there is a missing link and you're curious to know what more is out there for you. Then the intention of these interviews and weekly broadcasts are really to pinpoint what that is for you, to maybe provide the inspiration, motivation, or even pour some salt on the wound to give you some agitation to what it is for you that can get you to the next level of where you need to go to. So in helping us do that today, let me introduce our first guest. Now, my guest today has occupied senior roles in both finance and economics. But nowadays, she's more into speaking, she's a consultant, she's a career coach, she's an author and runs her own business. She is a leadership expert. She runs leadership events called GLAM, Great Leaders Are Made, for women in management and leadership positions in organizations. She's also received the Coaching Leadership Award at the Global HR Excellence Award at the World Human Resource Development Congress in Mumbai. She is nominated seven times for Telstra Businesswoman of the Year. She's won the Lifetime Achievement in HR Award. She's regularly featured on radio and TV and was the ABC's resident expert on workplace relations and HR. She's the author and the expert on developing Generation Y and what motivates them. Avril Henry, welcome to Unbox Your Gift. Hi, how are you today? Good, thank you. Now, Avril, that biography that I just read is there is a whole lot more to it. That's just a tiny slither of piece that I've read out. You are a very accomplished woman. So <laughs> anyone who listens to that kind of goes, oh, my goodness. So if you can please take us to rewind. And because you started off in economics and finance and where you are now is not at all where you started off. So can you please tell us how did it all begin? How did the pieces come together to just give us an insight into that? Look, um the thing is, I studied accounting and economics at university because I won a scholarship. And I think it's really important for people as listening in on this program to realise the power of dreams and goals. And so I started setting goals when I was about 13 years old. And um, maybe I'm a bit of an old soul, but I also had what I called big dreams. So when I talk, especially to school, high school students, and um, I lecture at the University of Western Sydney, and I'm talking to my students, I talk to them about the power of having big dreams, which is the big picture, and then underlying that is having goals to achieve those dreams. So I want a scholarship to go to university. I grew up in a um, poor family, so not all white South Africans are rich. And without that scholarship, I wouldn't have gone to university. So I think it's important for listeners to know that no matter where you start from in life and no matter where, what your circumstances are, you do have the power to change it through choice, hard work, tenacity and perseverance. Mm -hmm. And in fact, tenacity and perseverance are far more important than intelligence, in my opinion. And so I studied accounting and economics because it seemed like I, was, I liked numbers and I was good at numbers, but it seemed like a stable career to have. Mm -hmm. And having come from a family with no money, um, what I wanted was to have a job where I would have consistent employment. And I chuckle about it now, because to make a decision at 16 to do accounting and economics in itself is, you know, so that you've got financial stability yeah. going forward is yeah. kind of funny. Yeah. And in fact, um, at the time, my principal at my school tried to discourage me because he said accounting and economics were boys' subjects and he couldn't understand why I wasn't doing typing and shorthand like the other girls. And when I said to him I want to go to university, he said, but why? Um, you know, what's wrong with being a teacher, a nurse or a bank teller? Wow. I'm like, well, I don't want to be a teacher, a nurse or a bank teller. I want to be an accountant. 
And so I studied accounting and economics and then emigrated to Australia when I was 22 without telling my parents <laughs> for political reasons. And when I got here, that's where I worked. So I worked in structured finance, I worked in banking, I worked in IT. Um, got, I was one of the first women with children to be sent to London for two years when I was in investment banking. And when I came back to Australia in the early 90s, in the middle of the recession that Paul Keating said we had to have, I went to Westpac, mm -hmm. which is where I worked in both finance and IT roles. And it was while I was there that I met Anne Sherry, who had just been recruited by the new CEO, Bob Joss. And she saw me doing a presentation on the business case for some new multi-million dollar technology that I thought we should be investing in. And afterwards, she asked me to have a meeting with her and she was the new head of HR policy, um, diversity, workforce planning. And she said, I'd like you to come and work for me in HR. And I said, HR, I don't think so. That's not a real job. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it meant to anyone listening is from my HR background. Mm -hmm. And I said, but I want to work for you. So it was about the person, not the job. Mm -hmm. And I said, but here's the thing, I'm only coming for a year or two because that's as long as it will take to learn everything there is to learn right. about people and HR. Mm. And she chuckled and said, I'm not hiring you for your people skills because you don't have any. Wow. Wow. I'm you for your finance skills. So the interesting thing is that I found my passion in a very indirect way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what happened was that someone else saw my passion before I did. And it was Anne Sherry. She looked at me. And she probably knew that because of my background, I was very passionate about gender and race and equality in the workplace, which was quite separate to what I was doing in my job. Anyway, I was actually appointed the very first head of diversity at Westpac, and it was a senior role. Mm. Because in the past, you know, people did jobs like EO coordinator and affirmative action coordinator, mm. but they had no power. But I was actually a senior manager. So I had power, so to speak, and accountability. And, you know, if I reflect on one of the things I'm most proud of in my career, it would have to be the woman together with Anne Sherry who introduced, first in Australia, six weeks paid maternity leave in the private sector at Westpac in 1995. Wow. So first company to introduce paid maternity leave. Mm in the private sector mm, amazing. and I actually built the business case for paid maternity leave and then I built the business case for addressing bullying and harassment and that I just loved what I did it was like oh my god this is what I'm supposed to be mm, doing mm. and it's interesting you know I had no experience in HR no experience in diversity and did send me off to AGSM to do postgrad studies in strategic human resources management but it was actually being involved in those projects and we did projects for getting more women into team leader roles and middle management. We built the biggest childcare centre in the Southern Hemisphere by a corporate. We did employee assistance programs. You know, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And in the space of three years, between Anne and I, we won almost every award you could win for improving the workplace for women. Wow. And I even got highly commended awards from the Human Rights Commission for my education programs on discrimination, harassment, sexual harassment and bullying. I mean, that's stuff I did in the mid-90s. So some people remember it, others don't. Mm. But I then started to realise that you had to develop leadership capability to enable people to understand that it's not just about technical skills and financial skills. All the stuff that people call soft skills actually delivers hard results and it's really important and you know as I said to Anne back in 1994 I'm only coming for a year or two and then I'm going back to finance well here we are 18 years later wow. and it's gone back to finance well done well done so it's obviously that is your true passion is that we're talking about human resource absolutely I have what I call the um, TGIM factor which is thank God it's Monday and I get to go to work because I oh. love it. That's you know, a lot awesome. of people have 
Thank yes. God it's Friday and I don't yes. have to go to work. Yeah. I, just, oh, I love my job. Okay. It never, never feels yeah. like work. Never. So, so tell me, that's just key because I was listening to a graduation talk you did at the University of Technology in Sydney and you were yeah. talking to a graduate, obviously, a graduation class, and you said that the, a parting advice that you gave them was you'll never be good unless you're passionate about what you do. Now, it's, it's exactly what you're saying, but can you give, because our listeners are exactly in that, oh, I hate Mondays and I can't wait for Friday. That's the syndrome, right? So how do you get from the finance, because someone saw it in you, but obviously you had to do a presentation for someone to say, ah, oh, Avril's got something that could really work here. So what's that insight? I remember saying that because, funnily enough, I said it to my first-year students yesterday because I teach the gifted students at the University of Western Sydney. So they're already technically and intellectually brilliant. And I said to them, and I would say it again to your listeners, you can be technically competent at a job and do a good job, mm. but you will never be brilliant. Mm. You will be brilliant the day you love what you do wow. because you will put in 150% and you will bring your whole person to work. And I think what happens is people bring their head to work but not their heart. Mm. And until you connect the head with the heart, you will not be truly passionate about what you do and you will not be brilliant. You'll be good, mm. you might be very good, but you will not be brilliant. Mm. And so I think... You know, one of the things we do in career coaching is I ask people very simple questions, which your listeners could be asking themselves, is what do I really love doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and express it in broad terms. I like working with people or I like organising projects or I love organising the office. And, you know, there are some people who are really, really good at detail and admin and getting things perfect, then that's what they should be doing because they love it. And then there are people who go, oh, please don't give me the detail, don't make me fill in paperwork. But they are brilliant at interacting with people. Mm. And, you know, I even think of one of my daughters. She can talk to you whether you are a two-year-old toddler or a crotchety 85-year-old who, you know, is having a bad day. Mm. And I've never seen anybody quite like her in the sense that I've seen other people, of course, but you know, just has this capacity to connect with people. Mm -hmm. And so when you start asking yourself firstly, what am I good at and what do I like doing? And then equally importantly, which people don't ask themselves is, what don't I like doing? Mm -hmm. If you don't like certain things, don't be doing them because it's going to feel like hard work and it's going to drag you down. And it's what I call doing a simple SWOT analysis on yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Where are the opportunities to build on my strengths? And what are the threats that may force me to go to places and to do things that I don't enjoy doing and I'm just not good at? Mm -hmm. And I think as a society, we spend too much time focusing on helping people overcome their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. You know, I use the analogy. It's like saying to an eagle, you're very good at flying, but you know what? I'd like you to be a good swimmer. Mm -hmm. Saying to the fish, well, you know, you really need to concentrate on developing your flying skills. The fish is never going to be good at flying. The eagle is never going to be good at swimming. So let's let the eagle fly and let's let the fish swim. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. It reminds me of a quote that Marcus Buckingham said in his book, Now Go Find Your Strengths, that when your child comes home and brings three A's and one, say, a C or an F, you'd say to a parent, well, which one are you going to now help the child? And parents usually say, well, I'm going to help them with the C or the F. And he said, that's the mistake. You have to focus on where their strengths are. Why do you go to where it's not? So it's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, by the way, I remember my father doing that. You know, I got um, five A's and a B, and he said, what happened? Mm. And he said nothing about the five A's, yeah. but he concentrated on why had I got a B. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, and I'm never going to be good at maths. Yeah. You know? So, <laughs> that. You know? And I actually say to people, when you focus on somebody's weakness, you actually dilute their strengths because yeah. you're taking them away from what they're good at. And I, I love presenting. I love teaching. Mm. I love educating people. I love running workshops. But I also love my subject matter. And so that also means that I spend an enormous amount of time doing 
research and reading. I'm like a sponge. Anything to do, you know, with leadership and diversity and the generations and communication, it's like you can't get enough. And that's the other thing that makes you brilliant mm -hmm. is you never think you know everything. You're always looking for what's next. Okay. So, so say it this way, uh, Avril, I'm in a situation, for example, a listener might say, I'm in a situation where I'm clocking in, I'm clocking out, I'm stuck with a mortgage, I'm stuck with trying to get my kids through school, and I know that I don't want to do what I'm doing right now, but how do I make that transition? What would you, advice would you give to that? Well, the thing is, I think it's very important to plan, um, and I think it's really important to have done your research and your preparation. So when I decided to leave corporate life, mm -hmm. and I was a senior executive earning very good money, and I still had a child at a private school. Mm. Um, I got some very good advice from a friend of mine who very successfully set up her own business and 10 years later sold it for quite a tidy profit to an American organization. And while her circumstances were different because she didn't have children and she had a partner, whereas I was a single mum, mm. um, the best advice she gave me was, she said, number one, know what you want to do. Number two, know who you want your clients to be. And number three, have enough income in the bank for 12 months to pay your mortgage and your bills because you won't pay yourself. Yeah. Just three really simple things. And so as an example, I was still in paid employment when I registered my company name, when I set up, the, I set up a proprietary limited um, company. So I set up my company name, I got my ABN, I worked on my branding, I knew what I wanted to do. So I wanted to go into the area of um, both professional speaking, but also to do workshops and to run programs on the different generations, on diversity, on gender, and progressively move into the leadership space. Because I think you need to get runs on the ground and one of the ways I actually did that was to write a book on Australia's best leaders by going and interviewing them. Mm. And out of that book, I actually developed workshops on what it takes to be an effective leader. Mm. The second is I knew that in order to monetize, so to speak, my gift, and That's I truly wonderful. believe my gift is words. Mm. Um, I, I've been blessed with um, an incredible ability to take words and either present them like now as I'm speaking or through written words because my books have been very successful but I didn't write my first book till I was in my 40s. Mm. But what I also knew was that in order to have a viable income I needed to target large clients in terms of large companies and government departments. And of course, that's where my networks were because I've been a head of finance in a large bank, but I've also been an HR director in an investment bank. I've been an HR director in a professional services firm and I've been an HR director in an IT consultancy. So I had a very good network. And with winning awards, you know, I often got asked to speak. So I went to the people who knew my work mm. and to the people who'd seen me speak and said, well, I now am self-employed, so I'll no longer speak for free. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in running workshops. And I think because I did have a good network and I had a good reputation, within two weeks I got my first booking for a workshop. Excellent. And the third thing was that I did um, put money away uh, so that I could pay the bills. So the other thing is I actually learned, um, you know, I'm, I'm like most women, love nice shoes, love nice clothes, things <laughs> like that, nice dinners, going to shows. But I also learned that and prepared myself that I would not be spending money on luxury items, but that I would have enough income put away to pay the bills, pay my daughter's school fees. And then, of course, for the first three years, I turned the fourth bedroom into a home office and worked from home. So that that way I didn't have, you know, very high overhead. Mm -hmm. So three key things were I knew what I wanted to do and I set up the company. So I knew what workshops I wanted to do and I was doing the prep. The second thing was I did know which clients I wanted to approach and I approached people who knew me. And the third thing was that I put away enough income for 10 months. Mm -hmm. And 
once I was in that position, I resigned from my job, which, by the way, was still scary. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Because I didn't have a partner who could, you know, back me up financially. Yeah. I did this. Um, you know, so I'd say to all your um, listeners, male or female, yeah. you know, if you've got a partner who's in a job, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're already better off than I was. Yeah. You, you've got a backup plan. My backup plan was me. And wow. my belief in myself, that was it. That was it, wow. And within two weeks, you got your first gig? Within two weeks, I had my first um, paid gig. Yeah. That's excellent. That's excellent. Now, the other thing that you really, um, and that's what's really amazing. Can I just say one thing, listeners, that I'm hearing that Avril talks about, and she said her gift is words. The way she talks about herself is, uh, what I'm hearing is, I was blessed, that this was an opportunity. Just that way of talking about yourself, of seeing the world in that realm rather than, it was a scary thing. It was not bleak. It was, there, there's a difference in language that I yes. find that in doing these interviews, Avril, that people like yourself who I interview, and I've, inter I've interviewed quite a few people now, they speak a certain language. And it's, the, it's yes. that optimism language. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, when I run the Great Leaders or Made program, mm. um, we have lots of fun. And on day one, I introduce them to slap therapy. And they go, what's slap therapy? And I ask the question, how many of you, and this includes your listeners, male or female, start sentences with, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I don't think I can do that, I'm a bit worried, I'm concerned, I'm not as good as so-and-so, I don't think I'm good enough. Mm -hmm. And everyone without fail puts up their hands and I go, right, now you need to go to the bathroom, stand in front of the mirror and slap yourself really hard. Because <laughs> after this, you are not allowed to start sentences with any of those phrases. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to have a can-do attitude, believe in ourselves. And the thing is that society has socialised us to believe, and especially in Australia. I mean, Australia is the land of the tall poppy syndrome. Mm. And I'm really fortunate because I've met amazing people on this 10-year journey I've been on as a speaker. And I was the, um, I would like to say, not the side act, I was the warm-up act for <laughs> Bryce Courtney at oh. a dinner about 10 years ago. And I talked, interestingly, about believing in yourself. And he then talked about dreams. And I'll never forget the most powerful line he used that night was he made reference to the tall poppy syndrome in Australia because he, like me, is also South African. And I'm not saying that South Africans are optimistic by nature. <laughs> but quite the contrary. I think it's, you know, not a cultural thing. I think it's what's inside of you or what you choose to create. Mm. And he said about the tall poppy syndrome, he said, the problem with the tall poppy syndrome is that when you cut down the tall poppies, all you are left with are the weeds. Mm. And is that what we want for oh. ourselves and our society? Beautiful. And I went, hallelujah. There, in my view, I would rather be a beautiful, bright red poppy wow. any day that's gorgeous, than yeah. the weeds below the poppies. Wow. That's just and beautiful. Yes. <laughs> wow. Wow. Drives the point home. Yeah, you have to believe in yourself. And one of my other favourite sayings, which is one of my own sayings, is that if you don't believe in yourself, you have no right to expect anyone else to believe in you. Wow. You know, self-leadership starts with self-belief. Mm. You know, I'm a good person. I'm working progress. I'm flawed. But you know what? I don't let my flaws hold me back. And by the way, the things that I'm not good at, I don't go there. I am never going to be good at crocheting. So you know what? Good luck to you if you're good at crocheting. I'm good at a whole heap of other things. Good on you. That, that's the attitude to have. Attitude, absolutely. Now, I, I, we're approaching our half, uh, halfway mark, Avril, before we go behind the scenes. But I do want to ask this burning question that's inside me that I, I know it's a passion of yours because I know you specialise in um, Gen Y and finding their motivators. And I remember I was, when I was doing my research on you, Avril, <laughs> and I was looking into the, the information that you, um, that you distribute, one of the things that you said are baby boomers have midlife crises, obviously, later in life. Yes. Your Gen X have, you know, like, oh, my God, what have I done with my life every seven to eight years? 
Yes. And then your Gen Ys have a constant battle with, oh, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? Is this what I want to do? Yes. So okay. with those things coming, how do you... Because I talk about that with Unbox Your Gift and I say that when it comes to your late 20s to early 30s, most people go, oh my God, am I where am I supposed to be? Did I achieve everything? Am I too old? Am I too young? Can I still do this? Can I still do that? Can I ask in your opinion, because we, uh, cause you do research in baby boomers and Gen Y and Gen X and obviously the veterans generation, are there differing aspects of how to identify what you're good at depending on where you sit in the category of Gen X, Gen Y or baby boomer? I think we have different approaches and there are a lot of people who go, oh, well, you know, we go through all the same life cycles. And I say, well, that's actually not true. And if you just take something as simple as marriage and having children and a mortgage, mm. baby boomers got married for the first time and now in their 40s and 50s on to their second and third marriages. Mm. They got married for the first time, women of 22, men of 23, had their first child baby boomer, women of 23, the first mortgage before they were 25. Mm. For Gen Xs, that is happening between 31 and 40. Wow. And for the Gen Ys, because they're concerned that they might not be able to have children because they're seeing that Gen X women are either not having children or only one child or having challenging times conceiving, they are doing the same things that Gen X are doing but maybe between about 29 and 35, so just a little bit earlier. So that's just one example. But the other thing that has shifted is that Generation X and Y are now the most educated generations in history. And with education comes more choice, but with education also comes higher expectations of organisations and of managers and leaders. And I would like to say that I don't think people should worry if they get to 30 going, oh my God, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? Because I think that if you are somebody who likes to do interesting things, if you are somebody who wants to learn new things, if you are somebody who wants to have new experiences, whether it's travelling, whether it's playing sport, whether it's taking up a hobby, you're never too old. You know, I feel like I'm getting ready for the next stage of my journey, which is, you know, looking at how I contribute to boards. And I'll still be doing some of the things I'm doing now, but not all of them, because it's time to do something different mm. and I think the problem is people think it's a box and that's why I love you know the title of your business you know unbox your gift I think people put themselves in boxes mm. and then they stay in those boxes mm. and they go I don't really like this box mm. but you know what I'm too scared yeah. and I'd like to you know leave people with this thought that fear paralyzes our ability to think creatively in life mm. And my challenge to your listeners is to ask themselves the question, what could I really do if I wasn't afraid? Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you so much, Avril. As you can see, guys, that Avril is one in a million. And I've been so excited to get her. Now, I've got to end the interview there, but I am going to take Avril behind the scenes and to really go into greater detail about just her research and her thinking about what she's done, how, as you can see, the information that she's providing is just priceless. So if you want to join us for behind the scenes of more of Avril, please contact us at info at unboxyourgift.com. That's info at unboxyourgift.com where I'm going to take Avril behind the scenes and really get deep, dig deep into the other issues that we want to cover t uh, today. So Avril, thanks so much. You're very welcome. Please thank hold you. on there. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week for Wednesday's weekly broadcast. Take care.